a few uh, a few brief slides to round out this section on how cardiac output should change with exercise and then why we're using dehydration to affect cardiac output or why we would ever expect dehydration to affect cardiac output. So you've seen by now in lab that the values during exercise will change. VCO2 changes, VO2 changes, that's not part of the calculation, percent CO2 changes, and those values would, when they're used to calculate cardiac output, mean that cardiac output changes. Well, of course it does. Heart rate and stroke volume go up. The amount of blood that has to be pumped, the rate, the flow rate, has to go up. So we'll briefly look at how cardiac output should change with exercise as power output goes up. We'll also look at how heart rate, stroke volume, blood pressure, resistance should change with exercise. Uh, actually, no, we're going to look at heart rate and stroke volume. These other two you're calculating, pressure or TPR from pressure. We don't have slides on TPR right now. And then um, I'll present the idea that dehydration will affect cardiac output somehow. Uh, specifically, the loss of body fluids compromises blood volume. So there's a gradual loss in fluid that impacts blood volume uh, to a greater degree than other compartments, and that will compromise stroke volume and feed back to cardiac output overall. That's the premise of these two labs that you're running right now. So um, this will be helpful for understanding why they're set up that way. And I always flip-flop back and forth on whether or not to include this flow chart in the lecture. And this, this year I decided to, but maybe I'm regretting it now. Um, it's really small. It's hard to follow. And basically, on there's two halves. On the left half, it's the normal situation. On the right half is when you start to sweat, how that situation is compromised. And the detail is not necessarily important. This just says that you decide to exercise at some point and then exercise creates a demand at the muscle, and everything that filters down afterwards is the responses that allow exercise to persist. So you decide to exercise, and then things like breathing rate and heart rate and blood pressure have new set point values. Well, how are those maintained? The muscle decides it needs to exercise, and there's metabolism occurring, so we have all of these signals that confirm our choice to exercise. The choice to exercise gets everything into the ballpark, and then the metabolism that occurs at the muscle is confirmation that, yes, that was the right way to approach exercise, or um, I need slightly more of this response, slightly less of this response. It, it titrates the response to exercise appropriately. So the rate of metabolism will dictate how much blood flow needs to go to the active tissues. That is, how much the, the vasculature, uh, vasculature needs to open up or close off. There's a very big drop in total peripheral resistance at the active tissue, which might not immediately make sense. But if you think about it, when you exercise, it's not... Um, a generalist situation. You're, it's not a jack-of-all-trades situation. Exercise is a specialist <coughs> situation. And the specialist in this case would be um, knee extensors for cycling or knee extensors and calves for running, some other muscles, etc. But the active musculature are the specialists. And so everything else in the body tends to close off you don't send a lot of blood to things like the liver. Um, you don't send a lot of blood to the gut. You don't send a lot of blood to the spleen. You really send a lot of blood to the active muscles by decreasing total peripheral resistance. You also send a lot of uh, blood to the brain and the other critical structures like the heart. But um, by far, the active muscle gets the uh, majority of the flow. And so that situation persists, and then we get feedback. Is heart rate good enough? Is um, the contractility or the forcefulness of heart beating good enough? Uh, 
Uh, is the tone appropriate to direct blood to those target tissues? And if so, great. If not, then we change um, the central command feedback to these cardiovascular centers and go from there. That can persist for a while. The monkey wrench comes when exercise also produces heat. You felt that before. You exercise, you get hot. Being hot is not tenable. It doesn't uh, it won't allow you to exercise for very long. You don't like being hot. You want to maintain body temperature at about 37 degrees. And if your core temperature uh, varies outside, a few degrees outside of that, you can die. So we want to mitigate this heat production. And we do that through increasing sweat gland activity. We divert blood to the skin so that it can be... Um, uh, dissipated to the environment, and thermoregulation persists. But the consequence of that is that we lose um, some volume in the blood. We lose some fluid from the blood that decreases uh, arterial and venous tone, reduces pressure in the vasculature. And if that gets large enough, all of a sudden we can start to affect heart rate and contractility, cardiac output will be affected, and that's the, uh, the point of the next couple slides to see how dehydration affects those values that you are concerned with in lab. So this is a detailed flow chart. You don't have to memorize this for the exam. I'll just say that. I'll show you the, um, the flow chart and we'll discuss it, but you don't have to memorize it for the exam. You should understand the concept, though, of how we get from a normal exercising situation and how that's compromised by dehydrating. That's the focus of Lab 5. So what we're looking at on the next couple slides, these charts are all set up in a similar way. They are how one value changes over time during exercise. And the four groups are um, increasing severity of dehydration. If you drink no fluid, you'll be very dehydrated. So the open circle is generally the one that we are focusing on as the extreme case. And then the closed symbols, they all kind of group together, but these are varying degrees of fluid intake. At the bottom, if you drink a lot of fluid, you are well hydrated. So this is the best case scenario. The closed circle, best case scenario. Open circle, worst case scenario. And in most cases, these are on opposite ends of whatever spectrum it is we're looking at. So this is to give you a sense of how varying degrees of dehydration will impact our values of interest. So this is blood volume. I've mentioned that to you a couple times. We get to see how blood volume changes. There's an initial drop, and then over the course of two hours, and this is moderate intensity, 70% VO2 max endurance exercise, we start to see separation. If you're well hydrated, you don't really lose any more blood volume. If you're dehydrated, you tend to lose a lot of blood volume. So by the time two hours has passed, there's a lot of separation here, another 4% blood volume lost in the group that's very dehydrated. And the question that we have now is what does that mean to lose an extra 4% to double the loss of blood volume in the dehydrated group. What does that mean? So over the course of these two hours, there's a progressive loss of blood volume. By the Frank Starling, uh, Starling Law of the Heart that we just looked at last week, we know that if there's less blood returning to the heart, less blood will be pumped. Conversely, if more blood returns to the heart, more blood will be pumped. So if there's just less blood available, it stands to reason that venous return would be lower. If venous return is lower, stroke volume would be lower. And absolutely that's the case. Over two hours, if you dehydrate severely the open circle, you see this steep drop in stroke volume. Whereas it's pretty well preserved if you're well hydrated. And there's various levels in between, depending on what degree of dehydration you experience. But the point is, the two ends of that spectrum, if you're dehydrated, you really compromise stroke volume. 
that's pretty bad for cardiac output and for exercise because we need to compensate. Your, your body is screaming. You're trying to stay exercising. In some um, historical cases, it would have been a life and death situation, so you're trying to maintain this power output, running away from a saber-toothed tiger, for instance. So heart rate increases. You're trying to compensate. Where you're really dehydrated, Stroke volume is uh, most compromised, and we see the largest acceleration of heart rate. The largest acceleration of heart rate. Those things work together. We know they combine to make cardiac output, despite our best efforts to compensate by increasing heart rate for the lower stroke volume, we still see this progressive drop in cardiac output over two hours. If you're well hydrated, it's maintained throughout those two hours. If you are dehydrated, it drops by three liters per minute, two or three liters per minute. So cardiac output should be lower in your person that exercises when they're dehydrated. Hopefully you have the same person exercising uh, in both labs because cardiac output is wildly different depending just on your fitness level as well. There's more here, but I don't think I want to go too much into well, it depends. Do we have time for a small tangent? I think we have a little bit of time. All we have to do is get through de uh, the depression slides by the end of Thursday's class, and that's not going to be a problem. Let's talk. Let's talk a bit more about dehydration because this is an area that I studied a fair bit in my uh, in my PhD. <coughs> I'm also noticing there's a lot of students kind of eye in the window. Maybe there was supposed to be an exam in here. I'm not really sure what's going on. They can come and learn. Who knows? So uh, this slide, really important. Loss of blood volume means stroke volume falls. We try to compensate by increasing heart rate, but we can't completely compensate. Uh, cardiac output is, is sacrificed or it reduces over two hours. Now, where we're, we're verging on um, environmental exercise physiology, the consequences of losing blood volume is essentially like you're putting on a sweater. And that's a bad thing to do during exercise, especially when you're trying to stay cool. What do I mean by you're putting on a sweater? What we're looking at here is forearm blood flow. And this is a surrogate measure to say, I know blood has to go to the muscle, and then it has to go everywhere else. And this is a measure to say how much blood is going to the skin. That is, how much blood that carries with it the heat of the body is at the surface of the skin where it can lose that heat to the environment. How much blood is at the periphery so that it can dissipate heat and help keep me cool? This is the blood from which sweat will take uh, heat when it evaporates. So it's a good idea to have a high forearm blood flow if you want to lose heat through sweat. And if you're well hydrated, you do. Forearm blood flow is, is maintained relatively high and even goes up over two hours. If you're dehydrated, no real change and even a, a decrease at the end of two hours. That means less blood is going to the skin. Your body has made the decision that exercise is important. I'm trying to increase heart rate to maintain cardiac output. I've got less blood to work with, so what am I going to do? I'm turning the taps off. I'm not going to send any blood to the skin because it's too important right now. I need to send it to the muscle so that I can continue to exercise. Your body sacrifices itself in a sense. And the consequence of that is pretty drastic. You don't send blood to the skin, you can't lose heat, body temperature goes up. And these are both measures of body temperature. 
esophageal and rectal temperatures, which are the classic ways to measure core temperature in uh, the exercise physiology field. You can't point to something in the body and say, that's a core. Like you can say, that's your quadriceps or your biceps brachii. You can't point to something and say, there's your core. So we just try to take measures at the center of mass. The esophageal temperature is somewhere in the center of the chest. Rectal temperature, you can imagine where that is. All those values tend to be fairly resistant to acute fluctuations. And they're analogous to body temperature in both cases where you have a high degree of dehydration, that is you're not drinking any fluid, blood volumes lower, <coughs> stroke volumes lower, heart rate skyrockets, yet cardiac output falls, and because you don't send blood to the skin, you get this exacerbated increase, this accelerated storage of body heat. Really hot. Really, really hot, and it makes you not want to exercise. In some cases, if you keep exercising, this can cause um, some pretty severe side effects and even death in some cases. Heat exhaustion, heat stroke, collapse, syncope, dizziness, confusion, death. So it's really bad. And this is one of the oldest topics in physiology research. It's, it's really well documented that for every uh, percent decrease in body mass, that is, along the bottom here, this is a measure of how dehydrated you are. If you're towards the right-hand side, you are very dehydrated. <coughs> you get a corresponding increase in uh, core temperature over time. The more dehydrated you are, the hotter you get during exercise, and the more at risk you are of adverse side effects. So it's, um, it's actually one of the reasons that we've been so successful as a species, that we've developed this response to be able to sweat, to try to maintain our core temperature as low as possible, while still being able to exercise. It's one of the reasons that we've been so successful as a species. Come on in. Maybe they've heard that this is a really interesting lecture. I don't know. And why am I putting this picture up? What, what does this have to do with us being successful as a species? Um, this is a comparison that highlights our success as a species in our ability to perform. And like all good comparisons and all good races, this idea was born out of um, a night at a pub in 1980. A fellow heard uh, someone across the bar saying that um, over a long distance, horses were faster initially, but over a long distance, he had no doubt that humans could match them or even be better in a race, humans versus horses, which you don't think is a immediately, um, it's not really justifiable. It's not an idea that makes a lot of sense because, of course, horses are faster. They're larger. Uh, they have more muscle mass. They can carry people and things, etc. Uh, humans wouldn't stand a chance. How are you doing? Awkward. Yeah. Let's just put a sign up outside for, for hats. Um, I lost my train of thought, but anyways, the man versus horse race has gone on every year since 1980, a comparison of the abilities, the endurance abilities of humans versus horses, uh, where you might think that horses are faster, always, on average they are, but it's a minute to 20 minutes. There are a few instances where humans have won the race, this is a marathon pace, 22 miles, uh, humans won by 2 minutes and 11 minutes in 2004, 2007. Otherwise, 1 minute difference last year, um, 5 minutes difference this year. The, the similarity in these performance times is pretty striking. 
And it's the ability of our bodies to thermoregulate and produce a really high power output, a consistently high power output for a long period of time that really allows us to be successful. And I would spin off here, there's a really interesting video that was part of a, a David Attenborough collection looking at um, the persistence hunt in the Kalahari. Some, some tribes in the Kalahari in Africa still use this approach in hunting prey where they don't need to set traps, they don't chase them quickly, they follow the tracks and they just jog after them. And our, our, our profound endurance ability allows us to outrun and outlast and uh, out-fatigue, I suppose, our prey. So this is something that's been used um, successfully over decades or eons of generations, one of the oldest, most uh, impactful um, responses that allows us to be really successful as a species, this thermoregulation and ability to maintain performance. So we're not going to spin off and watch that video, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Anyways, let's uh, let's summarize, because this is one section that we spent, what, two and a half weeks on now? We've covered a lot of information. I remember way back when we started, we were looking at measurements of cardiac function. Not, not the um, cardiac output per se, which is the job of the heart, but measuring the ability, the intrinsic ability of the tissue. And while we've taken a look at ECGs before, and we've used 12-lead ECGs to get a full 360 view of the heart, they're not always diagnostic. Exercise stress, uh, stress tests can evaluate the overall function of the heart, but we need more advanced localized tests to evaluate blood flow um, and some other uh, aspects of blood delivery to the tissue. If we're worried about things like uh, infarction, um, if we need to worry about placing stents and the like. ECGs aren't always diagnostic. They might indicate some, uh, some shortcomings. The, uh, the stress test will tell us if a person can tolerate exercise before they have chest pain and angina. Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about what parts of the heart are working. <coughs> Altogether, whether the parts of the heart are working or not, that impacts or that supports cardiac output. The job of the heart is to produce flow, to act as a pump, to always act as a pump. And so regardless of the intrinsic activity of the tissue, the overall function should be that it produces flow. There's some flow rate in liters per minute that we can measure in different situations. We can measure it directly with echocardiograms, Really, that's, that's not directly. That's indirectly. Um, we can measure it using dye or thermodilution, or we can measure it with a direct and indirect fix using the, um, the FIC principle. <coughs> Remember the difference between those? The direct fix was quite invasive. The indirect fix was our way to get around that invasiveness so as not to have to put a catheter into the right atrium of the heart. And the indirect FIC was a really ingenious technique that used not oxygen as the um, product of interest, but CO2. PCO2 in the arterial and the venous side, and then the rate of whole body CO2 production at the mouth. And with those three pieces of information, we can figure out how quickly blood must be traveling for those values to be as they are. For those values to be as they are. And then we went off on a bit of a tangent today to talk about, okay, well, now you're going to be able to measure these values in a normal situation and in a compromised situation where hopefully blood volume is reduced and we see corresponding changes in stroke volume, heart rate. You'll get to see how blood pressure changes. We didn't talk about that. And total peripheral resistance as well. <coughs> Does total peripheral resistance open up and allow more blood flow to those tissues? Does it clamp down because there's less blood? I'm not exactly sure. We'll find out in lab. 